When I was at university, I wanted to be a theatre director or make documentaries. Um, but when I uh, went to the Edinburgh Fringe at the end of my second year, I thought I was more interested in quite directly um, addressing social issues, but I still wanted to argue and persuade people. And I came across someone who was doing a law conversion course and thought that sounded interesting, so I applied. I do think I faced obstacles as a woman early in my career. I think it's something that when I came to the bar, it was almost a code of honour for women to say, no, I face no obstacles and do come and join me. I think it's quite important to admit that there were obstacles. And I think because of my upbringing, I didn't really notice them for a while. I thought I'd been brought up to be equal with my brothers. I went to a mixed sex school. I'd been told I could do whatever I wanted to do. And suddenly to find that there were people who, perhaps not overtly, perhaps not even consciously, but did find me uncomfortable or different because I was a woman um, was, was quite a shock and I, and I think it took me a while to realise that that, what was, that is what was going on. An example was doing a case um, abroad uh, when I was a junior um, with a QC um, who told me that other members of chambers who did, for example, planning inquiries had said they wouldn't use me as a junior on a case um, because their wives might feel uncomfortable about it um, or being aware that there were clients who I wasn't offered, and I was offered different kinds of work from um, the, the, the men who were taken on at the same time as me. We wanted to make the law more accessible, and that was both to consumers of legal services, but also to people who wanted to enter the legal profession. Um, and it was one of our core aspirations, and we wrote it down, um, that we would be more open and fairer in our um, recruitment processes, but we had a long-term aspiration to be 50% female. And I remember one of the older male members of the new chambers said, well, why write that down? It may be a long-term aspiration, but why write that down? And how not it going to be something you fail at? And it isn't, so we are now 50% female. And we have a really good retention rate for younger women, which is, I think, a really important thing about the culture we created. But when we started, there were only 24 of us. Uh, we took out loans on our houses. We took quite a big risk to do it. Um, and I think the oldest members of Chambers were in their mid-40s, maybe the one or two older. But we were mostly in our early 30s. And I had my first child 10 months after Matrix started. And she was number 11 in the Matrix football team of babies. So there were quite a lot of them. Matrix started at just the same time as I was having my children. And th that was quite a shock. So, for example, it's one of the few times in my life I've worried about money. When I came back from my first lot of maternity leave, there was a cash flow problem and I was employing a nanny. And I didn't know where the money to employ the nanny was going to come from. And then I very quickly had my second child. And I can see why that's a point where people think this is just not worth it. And I think if I hadn't been encouraged to stick in there, I might have decided it's just not worth it and there are other ways of making a living at that stage. Um, so that was quite difficult. My husband's academic, uh, he has quite a lot of evening events and overseas travel as well, but he's a very engaged um, father to our three daughters and I think he thinks it's important that they see that both their parents love them and bring them up and both of them work and have fulfilling careers outside the home as well. So it's always been a bit of a negotiation and I have sometimes um, wished I had a wife, but on the whole I think it's been very good for us and our children to say we all take part in all those bits of life and you can't have all of all of them but you can have bits of both of them. I do think it's important there's a critical mass of women in the legal profession now, still not enough, partly because there are more visible women and it doesn't feel as if women in the system are strangers quite as much as it did. Um, but I don't think we've gone nearly far enough, and I do think the language of the courts is very male. I still think um, women have a rough deal. There are stereotypes about women as uh, advocates and as um, parties in litigation, and they haven't gone away. And until recently, I thought that the, the history of women's rights was a history just of progress, and that we had to push the progress, but that's the way it was going. Um, I have three... Uh, daughters, two of them are teenagers, one of them's 11, and I am 
starting to worry that the world they are living in is more misogynistic and more difficult in some ways um, than the world uh, that I grew up in. Um, I think there are great challenges with the vast um, reservoirs of porn on the internet, for example, and, and the, the sexual images that they are expected to conform to and cope with. And the way that that informs boys' ideas about what women are like and what they want, I worry about that. Um, and I worry about the way that the uh, um, austerity and the inequality over the last few years that have grown over the last decade or so affect women um, and girls more than men. But at the same time, they are being brought up with aspirations and an expectation that they should be heard and they should have a role in life. And I think all you can do is, is try to encourage girls um, to expect a voice. A really interesting and important uh, recent case I was involved in was Miller um, and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. That was a case that happened straight after the EU referendum when the government said they were going to notify the EU of their intention to leave and a number of people challenged that and said um, that it was for Parliament to give uh, the executive permission to do that. So it was a really important constitutional case. And it was also very high profile because it was televised and it enabled a lot of people to see how the Supreme Court worked. It was also important for me because there were 55 barristers involved in that case, of whom three were women. And apart from Baroness Hale, um, who uh, was a, the only female member of the Supreme Court at that time, I was the only woman to speak. Um, and that seemed to me very shocking. There were four governments, all four nations of the United Kingdom were involved. Um, the government of England and Wales uh, had six barristers instructed. None of them was a woman. There was only one um, non-white barrister involved in that case, uh, Manjit Gill, and he too was for a claimant party. One of the things about the Miller case um, that I think is important is that it did bring to the surface a lot of things that perhaps were already there but people didn't know about. So the assumption that your safe pairs of hands are white men um, if you're a government lawyer. Um, that was something that you couldn't see necessarily, but it came to that case and people looked at it and thought, really? That's a bit shocking. Um, the uh, coverage of the enemies of the people in the media, the fact that there is a real populist movement against um, judges doing their job and the rule of law is something that perhaps wasn't really recognised until it was put so overtly that people had to recognise it. Mansfield was a college that was founded in the 19th century to um, widen access to Oxford for people who couldn't go there. Originally people from nonconformist backgrounds, but they um, had their first female student in 1913 before any other college was a, a mixed-sex um, college. And they now um, are very good at widening access for um, people from state schools and um, black and minority ethnic students in particular. So it's a very open-minded place. A few years ago, I came across uh, an image of Gwyneth Bebb, um, who was a woman who fought a test case in 1912 um, for the right for women to train to be solicitors. And she was um, trained as a lawyer. She applied and was told she couldn't because the application form that said persons wishing to be solicitors meant men wishing to be solicitors. And she and a group of other women fought that as a case to the Court of Appeal. They lost. Um, she then prosecuted black marketeers all the way through the First World War. And after the First World War, the law changed in 1919. She then applied to be a barrister, but by then she'd had a child and she died shortly after her second child was born. And I came across a little picture of her. I just thought she looked like the sort of woman I would have liked to know. Um, and I thought what a struggle she'd had and how hard she'd worked and how she hadn't actually achieved what she wanted. But it was because of her challenging the norms of her day that women like me could have the careers we had. Thank you.